here at this Blanton Curated Conversation. My name is Vanessa Davidson. And I am the Blanton's Curator of Latin American Art. And joining me in this conversation about a very unique area of our collection is Florencia Basano, who is the Assistant Curator of Latin American Art. Um, and together we'll be walking you through uh, how male art developed in Latin America with several key examples, um, as well as talking about why our collection has such a rich archive, a rich treasure trove um, of these materials. Uh, before I begin, before, before we kick uh, this presentation off, um, a few notes. Um, in case you are wondering, uh, the Blanton will remain temporary, temporarily closed until further notice. We are looking closely at Governor Abbott's report and recommendations and will reopen when we are able to properly protect the safety and health of our staff and visitors in accordance with university guidelines. So please stay tuned on social media and check your email for updates on an opening date. Um, your audio is muted, uh, so we can't hear you, but at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button that says Q&A, um, and we'll be answering your questions um, partly throughout the presentation and, and, and perhaps a little bit afterwards. So please feel free to send us any questions that might arise um, uh, as, as they arise, as they come to you. Um, and because this is happy hour, we're hoping that you are all enjoying a caipirinha from Brazil or a caipirosca uh, made with vodka instead of cane sugar liquor or uh, a very good Malbec from, from Argentina. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to begin. I am going to be giving you a short presentation on the development of male art in Latin America, um, which happens to be the subject of my dissertation, um, my PhD dissertation. So the, uh, the subject, the title of my talk tonight is From Margin to Margin and Back Again, Male Art in Argentina and Brazil. And I wanna begin with an example. In 1975, uh, the Brazilian artist Paulo Bruschi created his entry for the last exhibition of male art that was organized by Horacio Zavala and Edgardo Antonio Vigo in, La Pla in, Argentina, in Buenos Aires in Argentina in December of that year. And as you can see here, it was an enormous work measuring almost two meters long and one meter wide. And Bruschi documented this performance of carrying this letter with the help of his friends uh, from his home to the central post office in Recife. Um, and he called the performance Postacion, which means postal action. Um, and this episode uh, really epitomizes for me the way that Bruschi uh, saw the mail service, the, the system of mail as an alternative communication network that could be subverted to our artistic ends, to creative ends. And that postal subversion was shared by Edgardo Antonio Vigo himself, whose exhibition it was of mail art, uh, and also Leonard Frank Deutsch. And Vigo um, and Dutch uh, lived in different places, um, but they all uh, exchanged letters and artworks through the mail uh, via post um, for 20 years, uh, from the 1970s, the mid 1970s until 1997 in Vigo's, when, when Vigo passed away. Um, and what is so intriguing about this is that they both, all three artists come from marginal cities in terms of the centers of artistic production in their countries. Vigo is from La Plata, Argentina, which is 60 kilometers away from Buenos Aires, but feels like a small town. And both Recife, both Duch and uh, Bruschi are from Recife, which is in the Northeast corner um, of Brazil. But they are united, um, although their works differ greatly, as you'll see this evening, they're united in one central aspect. And that is to work to blur the boundaries between art and life, to make art into life and life into art. And Vigo did this 
um, by open by issuing open calls to participatory action via the mail. And Bruski did this uh, by using his own body as artistic raw material. And Dutch did this by presenting his everyday activities as art. So as you will see this evening in this very short presentation to give you an introduction to mail art in Latin America, uh, these three artists uh, were, although they live in the margins of their country's artistic centers, their, uh, their, uh, their actions and their work was radical and groundbreaking. Um, and it was especially important um, in, an, in an era of military dictatorships, uh, which made extraordinary art difficult. So they made extraordinary art in a time that made extraordinary art difficult, and they made male art into an exercise of freedom uh, during this time. Uh, now, I would like to also begin uh, this presentation with just a short overview of male art, because many of you may not have encountered this before. Whenever I uh, talk to people about my dissertation, I always have to spell it. I always say I wrote my, dis my dissertation on male art. That's M-E-I-L, not M-A-L-E. Uh, so male art, um, in, in essence, is a form of communication in which artists subvert the original use of the postal system and use it as a ready-made network for artworks and objects um, without any expectation of financial reward. So the sole unifying characteristic of male art, which can be very diverse, as, you, as you'll see this evening, um, is its travel through the mail. Um, some uh, scholars date the, the inception of male art uh, to 1919, to Marcel Duchamp's altered postcard of Mona Lisa, which in French, elle a means she has a hot ass. Um, we might go even further back um, in Duchamp's uh, work and look at his uh, postcards for the rendezvous of Sunday, February 16th, 1916, which were four postcards taped together that he sent to his benefactors, the Ehrensbergs, um, in, uh, while he was living in Paris and they were living in New York. Um, others talk about the futurists and the, the par parole and liberté. The, that they sent one another, uh, objects such as this, which they would send one another through the mail as the, origin of, as the origins of mail art. Um, and in the middle of the 20th century, Eve Klein famously painted postal stamps with his signature uh, patented international Klein blue uh, to send out invitations um, to his gallery exhibitions. But for our purposes, the the father of the modern male art movement was named Ray Johnson. And Johnson had studied at the Art Students League in New York um, in the mid 50s. And then he moved to North Carolina and studied at the Black Mountain College with John Cage and Joseph Albers um, in, in the late 1940s. And when he returned to New York, he began sending a very small circle of friends, objects such as this. Um, objects uh, of drawings and collages and postcards. Um, and what was, what was so interesting about this is that those friends then sent them to their network, networks of friends, which then sent them to their networks of friends. And the circle widened and widened and widened until it became international. And initially, um, Johnson had called the school, the New York School, the New York Correspondence School, to differentiate it from the New York School of Abstract Expressionism, which was then um, all the rage in New York City. But one of the things that he did that was so important was to create works that were collaborative. So this is just an example um, of a work that he would send, uh, please add to and return to Ray Johnson. And he would get back um, works such as this. So um, essentially, um, as another scholar has stated, male art was not created for the real world or for real world galleries. It was created by artists for artists. And ultimately, quote, male artists are concerned with the mechanics of communication in general, with aesthetic communication in particular, and especially with the aesthetics of communication. I forgot to mention that uh, beginning um, in the 1960s, uh, the group called Fluxus under the leadership of George Machunas, Machunas also uh, began mail art activities um, in New York City. And this is one uh, that 
uh, Ben Vautier did called the postman's choice, which on either side of the postcard is a room for an address. So that's a, it's the postman's choice of who to send it to. Um, but what is most important about what Fluxus did, especially in terms of their contributions to mail art, um, is that they provided address lists for their members that were far flung um, all over Europe um, and uh, North America. And those address lists were vital for organizing uh, mail art exhibitions and for use in a, in a very, in, as a seedling to send one's own mail art to others. Um, now, I also wanted to say that Vigo, Edgardo Antonio Vigo, who I mentioned earlier, was one of the most prolific writers on mail art in Latin America. Um, and just to conclude this uh, opening introduction, I want to read to you from an article that he wrote in 1975. He said, when a sculpture is sent by mail, the creator is limited to utilizing a fixed means of transport to move an already created work. When the sculpture was being created, this transfer was not taken into account. On the contrary, in the new art language we are analyzing, the fact that the work must travel a set distance is part of its structure, is the work itself. The work has been created to be sent through the mail. The postal system then does not exhaust its function in the transfer of the work, but incorporates and conditions it and the artist changes in turn the function of this medium of communication. So you can see how articulate he was, um, even working from his marginal city of La Plata in Argentina. Um, and Deutsch actually wrote to Vigo um, in many letters um, that they exchanged. He said, I think that in Europe and the USA, the problem is a bit different. There, there is no vital necessity for communication as in our Latin America. Uh, marginal by its very nature. For me, mail art was the only way out for my creativity and for my life. So just uh, reading that to voice this sentiment that these artists were felt so isolated under military dictatorships, which in Brazil lasted from 1964 to 1985, and in Argentina, the dirty war lasted from 1976 to 1983, but political turmoil and persecution um, and chaos really began um, about a decade earlier in 1966. Um, now, despite Vigo, Vigo was on the left, excuse me, Vigo was on your right, um, and his friend is on, on your left. Um, it's, what is so interesting about Vigo's connection to mail art is that he really is the progenitor of this medium um, in Latin America. He was the first to send out uh, mail artworks beginning in the late 1960. Um, but he, uh, he actually stumbled into this pioneering role almost by accident. As he expressed in a letter to uh, a colleague in London, in 1995, quote, the same thing happened to me as to you. I created envelopes for my mailings of enclosed materials, postcards, stamps, and used rubber stamps without knowing that since 1950, the School of Correspondence founded by Ray Johnson had begun to create the foundation for such practices. So although he was a pivotal member of the mail art movement, he almost stumbled into its history by accident. Um, the first work I want to show you of Vigo's is called Obras Incompletas. It's from 1969. And what you're seeing are an envelope on the far left and uh, five cards that will be sent through the mail uh, within that envelope. And uh, according to the instructions uh, here that you see on the left, um, Vigo was very uh, active in striving to make um, his art audience more connected to his work. So he said, for example, in this uh, guidelines, in the, in, the, in the text of his Obras Incompletas, his incomplete works, he said, uh, the accompanying instructions specify that in line with the theory of participation art, a certain percentage of the creation is transferred to you. 
So these are really do-it-yourself kits for making ready-mades. And this is Vigo's version. He did it on bottles of Bowles Gin, which were uh, marketed as the traditional drink of the Argentine gauchos. Um, and of course, we, I, I think that this work evokes uh, Duchamp's iconic bottle rack, his, his ready-made, uh, the bottle rack of 1914. Uh, but just to show you how creative his collaborators could be, uh, this is Julian Blaine's family um, version of, of Obras Incompletas. Uh, the whole family lined up nude in their garden with the Obras Incompletas stickers uh, upon their backs. Um, Vigo also created works that he called signalings. Um, and these were, according to him, meant not to represent, but rather to present objects that were not sheltered or hidden in museums and galleries, but present in the urban landscape for all to, for all to appreciate. And what he did with his first son, uh, Señalamiento, his first signaling, uh, what was called the Manojo de Semáforos um, of 1968. And it involved what he called an aesthetic a gratuitous aesthetic contemplation of these streetlights. So on the, on the evening of October 25th um, of 1968, um, at the corner of First Avenue and 60th Street in La Plata, people gathered to appreciate the beauty of the street, of the street lamp. Again, turning art into life, making life of, into, of, into an integral part of art, um, taking something that exists in the urban landscape that one might take for granted and trying to tease out um, its aesthetic beauty. And he took this even further um, in projects that he called Proyectos para Realizar, or projects to be realized. Um, and these are four uh, envelopes, that he, the four uh, cards that he sent through the mail. It's a series of four. They're called Actions Interconnected by Sequences from 1973. Um, and the first action uh, prescribes that the recipient turn around and memorize all that they've seen. Um, memory that can be erased when they turn in the opposite direction. Uh, the second is called uh, modification by soaking, and he wants uh, participants to catch the atmosphere in their hands and soak what they have captured. Uh, the third involves crossing the street um, and taking a visual inventory of things um, and then crossing back again. And the fourth involves hitchhiking and assessing the time uh, that is the way uh, that, that it takes to move from one part of the city to the other. So these works really make the recipient into the, into the collaborator, the recipient into the author um, of many of these works to be realized. And the culmination comes um, in the late 60s and 70s. This is called Aslo, um, which means in Spanish, do it. Um, and what you're seeing here is um, an envelope and uh, the work that I found in MoMA's archives um, in New York. And Aslo, do it in 70, 1970, could mean anything. It could mean brush your teeth. It could mean propose marriage to your girlfriend. It could mean uh, go out to dinner. It could mean go for a walk. It could mean anything. So he gives the participant, the recipient of these male artworks, license to see any activity that they, they, they choose to perform as an artistic act because he gives them that permission. Um, and the last work, which I think is, 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 is so poetic, um, is actually comes from 1969 and this is the last page um, of his uh, of the last issue um, of his magazine Diagonal Cero um, from 1968 and this simple sheet with a round uh, dot cut in the center um, it has instructions below as do most of Vigo's works instructions that are as ambiguous as they are humorous uh, he says quote make your own visual poem painting object sculpture, landscape, still life, nude, self-portrait, interior, any kind of genre of art. And its mode of use is, quote, to place at a prudential distance before your eye and frame with free liberty the genre you desire. So with this simple card uh, with a hole cut in the center, um, he creates art that is a frame uh, for everyday experience, a frame for life. Um, and he grants the recipient of these mail artworks or of these magazines that he also sent through the mail, the license to view anything around them as art. Um, so he works in this liminal space between art and life um, in which 
the paper supports um, of his artworks become lenses in which art and life look indistinguishable. Now, Bruschi uh, took a different tack in his mail art. What I'm showing you here is a work called Return to Sender. Uh, what he did was to mail out um, hundreds of envelopes with, the wrong, with uh, errors in the addresses, which all made, them ma made their way back to him in Recife. Um, and then he created a collage um, of all what of what mail artists called noise, all the bureaucratic markings that accumulated on the on the envelopes. Um, and this is actually a photocopy that's in our collection. So as you can see, he not only used the original as a mail art piece, but he also used photocopies. And I just want to give you a very brief insight into the way that he thought about art. This is a performance uh, that he did in 1978 called "What is Art? What is it for?" And that's what the language means on the billboard hanging around his neck. What you see him doing right here is standing in the vitrine um, of a bookstore. What he did was to walk around the streets of Recife wearing this, this, this banner around his neck. Um, and it, I think that this episode is so important because in his performance works as well as his male artworks, he used humor, irreverence, and defiance as potent artistic strategies in the era of the dictatorship. He wanted to bring art out of galleries, out of museums, and into the street, um, and also out into alternative communication networks via mail art. Um, and he also wanted to question the nature of the artistic process. What does it mean to make art during the dictatorship? For whom does one make it? How is it consumed? Um, and this took up a lot of a lot of his time, his performances, um, as well as his mail art. And during the day, he worked at a hospital. And so many of the images that you're going to see now come from the inner workings of his body using the hospital's uh, equipment. Uh, so that art becomes life through this uh, subversion of hospital equipment into uh, materials uh, used to create artworks in and of themselves out of the body's uh, processes. And what you're seeing here um, is a 1976 piece called My Brain Draws in This Way. And what he did was to use the hospital's encephalo encephalogram machine to trace his brain waves, uh, which he sent out as, as the booklet that you saw earlier, but also stamped uh, with uh, words and slogans um, and sent uh, through the mail in this way. Now, another series that he used the hospital pieces for was called Altum Radium Retratum. Um, and he began this series in the same year in 1976. Um, and I must say, these are some of the most striking images that I found in my research um, of mail art uh, for my dissertation because uh, not only are there x-rays included inside the envelopes, but there are post postings outside that harbor clues uh, to the envelope's content. So, for example, this is one of the, art the artworks that I found in the Vigo archive in Argentina, and it's unsettling because x-rays um, evoke human frailty as they are used to diagnose broken bones and disease. So what he's doing is to use the hospital's equipment used to, used to, um, used to cure this, uh, the ills of the community into a denunciation um, of society's own ills. Um, and he was arrested three times for being subversive, once in 68, uh, again in 73, and again in 76. Um, so he made ironic works um, about having an identity protector um, needed to, to create his mail art because he was so persecuted and his activities were under so much censorship. Um, he also made very unsettling pieces such as this, which he sent through the mail um, for our disappeared ones uh, from 76 to 86. Um, he also created works that were even more graphic, such as this uh, work called Treatment Outside the Home, where you have a red stained, a blood stained gauze on the outside of the envelope. Um, and whether they were produced inside the hospital or outside in his studio, um, they were all very radically political. Um, and that is a, a hallmark of his art. Now, uh, Bruschi was also uh, the first artist to use the Xerox machine as an artistic device, although many artists later on did use Xerox um, in their mail art. But what you're looking at here 
um, is an example of what he called zero performances, uh, Xerox performances, um, which he would do by his set by himself, uh, bending over the machine uh, with his hands, with his face, uh, with um, cries for help. This is called o me grito, which means my cry or yell. Uh, we can imagine him standing on in front of the Xerox machine, um, crying for help in this uh, dark era of the military dictatorship in which he said happiness was forbidden. So whereas Vigo's art was dark and political, um, Duch serves as a linchpin in this talk because his art was more playful, uh, but it also posited art as life, as did Vigo's, but he commonly used Xeroxes, as did Bruski. Uh, so what you're looking at here is an image that I showed us, uh, one of earlier, uh, his series, I Am Duch and Not Duchamp, uh, Duch Kiss Duchamp, Duch Things and Ready Maids, comparing himself to the, to the, to the master of Ready Maids. But what he really did in all of his um, all of his art making was to reproduce uh, the motto, art is life. And you see that Archi e Vida uh, right in front of Duch um, there at the end. Um, and I think that this is so important because it comes back to what we're talking about, about art being made out of life, out of the very substance of life. And these are envelopes that I found um, in the Vigo archive, in the Vigo archive in La Plata, um, and it's it's part of his I Am an Artist series. But first, I just want to read to you a little bit uh, of his letters to Bruce to uh, Vigo, which are very heartfelt um, and very intimate. He said, "For me, mail art has a function and importance that you cannot imagine. I changed my behavior. I'm not the same Leo as ten years ago. Mail art opened my head and my mouth and my heart." It opened my whole being. It broke all of my introspective and solitary silence. Um, but then even more forcefully, he expresses sentiments about the political um, and economic situation in Recife. Uh, it's saying to be going on 1987, quote, the political situation couldn't be worse and the economy is a mess. There no longer exists the minimum possibility of having at the very least a, a dignified life. To make art here, what for? For whom? Uh, but then he included in the same letter, men like you, Vigo, are what keeps my hope up, are what keep, keep my hopes up. So what I'm showing you here are images from his I Am an Artist series. Uh, and any everyday activity was fair game. He could be playing with his youngest child. He could be walking down the street, uh, stretching in the park. Uh, laying down for a nap or drinking a bottle of beer. He could be support, he could be horsing around with a cement mixer, all stamped with the slogan, I am an artist, I am an artist. Um, or at a bar drinking alone and then very bored and drunk uh, by himself. Um, and what I think is so interesting about the series um, is what he wrote uh, for an exhibition in Amsterdam in 1980. He said, Quote, all my mail art in the last years has been based on the cultural reality I live. By I am an artist, I mean a state of anguish, agony. It's dangerous to be an artist in my country, but I am an artist and I have to say it aloud by shouting, I am an artist. So he goes, uh, this series um, goes on for many different works, um, especially those that have to do with censorship uh, because apparently uh, being, he, he, had, he had worked as a factory manager, but apparently that was not enough. He was forever frustrated by the lack of recognition that he received as an artist. Um, so this series, um, it really speaks, speaks to that sentiment. Now, and of course, he continued this um, into the age of, commu of, uh, of computer imaging. So with the series that I've showed you, Vigo, Bruschi, and Duch work at the intersection, at the boundary where life and art intersect. And they blur that boundary. They make it into a liminal space between art as life and life as art, whether it be for, by uh, act proposing actions for willing participants in the mail, by revealing the inner processes of one's body sent to anonymous artists around the world, 
or by presenting one's everyday life as an artistic enterprise, these two artists work where life and art, these three artists work where life and art intersect. Um, and though Vigo never met Bruschi or Dutch in person, the male art in uh, relationship and friendship that they developed was intimate and long lasting. And as Vigo signed off in a letter to Bruschi dated May 15th, 1978, quote, fraternal greetings to Dutch, his daughter, drink a beer together and place an empty glass on the table. You can be certain that I will be inside of it accompanying you. So that is the end of my presentation. And now I wish to ask Flora some questions about other objects of mail art that we have in our collection. Um, and I was delighted to find that we have so many instances of mail art. So Flora, would you like to talk about uh, this work by Dipborn? Sure. Uh, we have two important art artists, male artists in the collection. One is Eugenio Dietborn, who is a well-known contemporary artist from Chile. He worked at a time when censorship and the repression of the military dictatorship in Chile had created a sense of isolation in the local artistic community. So he made what he called airmail paintings, first to communicate his ideas about Chile bypassing censorship, and second to participate in the international art scene. So during the 80s, these airmail paintings uh, that he made combined a photo seal screen, drawing, painting, and collage. He recycled images he found in places such as uh, discarded police files and in the media. Uh, and he recycled these images as a way to address the plight of marginalized people, ranging from petty criminals to victims of state violence. The brown paper that Dithborn chose as his support was easily folded and stuffed into envelopes and circulated internationally through the postal service. The envelopes, which are always shown next to the uh, work, are, are actually a, a key part of the work because they make visible two things. The distance between Chile and the rest of the world because the envelopes keep all the addresses where the work circulates, and also the conceptual strategies that male artists use to bridge that geographic distance. Uh, so uh, another artist that is in our collection is Claudia de Rio. She's an Argentine contemporary artist that during the 1990s was part of Vigo's male art network. She sent to the Palantin this work of male art called uh, to Edward D. Wood Jr. Uh, it is a series of collages uh, that were made in 1995 uh, featuring laundry, laund uh, laundry soaps commonly used in Argentine households. So these, these are the images of uh, the work of Claudia del Rio. Uh, she used uh, these humble bars of soap to address the ideology embedded in brand names designed to appeal to female consumers by using names such as model or espuma or soap um, or foam that she illustrated or uh, collaged with idealized uh, female figures taken from vintage magazines and in some cases the collaged figures offer an ironic commentary on how the brand names that sought to highlight the soap strength were defined in ways that were traditionally masculine. Perhaps we can move on to the next image. Uh, so we have names associated with animals that are company with armed hunters, pointing out that the subtle uh, sense of violence that is encoded into everyday objects. Now, an interesting thing is that she dedicated this work to Ed Wood, who is the famous US director of notably bad beat movies, because she admired his ingenuity in producing movies with very few resources. So she celebrates his ability to make do. So uh, this is the two important artists that we can find uh, as uh, part of the Blanton collection. 
That's fascinating, Flora. And I would, well, I would love it if you give, if you could give us a sense um, of the history of, of, of collecting mail art at the Blanton. Why I was so delighted that we had so many objects of mail art uh, when I first uh, started in October here. And um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, a bit about why our archive um, has so very many. Well, I think in part is because in the 1990s, artists began to make connections also not with other artists, but with institutions abroad and began connecting with curators. So Bigo began to write to Mary Carmen Ramirez, who was a, a curator here at the Blanton, and sent to her numerous letters and envelopes with mail art, uh, which created sort of the core of a wonderful collection of the work on, uh, by Vigo. Uh, Claudia del Rio, also, who also uh, knew uh, uh, the work of Vigo and they exhibited together, so she also sent us her work. So we got really lucky that they made this connection with the Blanton and sent us their work. And here we can see um, uh, all of us working uh, in, in the matting and framing room, uh, preparing one of the um, uh, cases in which we often show male art. And here, Flora, what I think is so interesting just about these two images is that um, some of the male art that we received from Vigo um, has yet to really be categorized because it was so difficult to classify. Um, so that's one thing that I'm very looking forward to doing uh, when we get back in the doors of the building um, is to sit down and really look through this material. We have 69 objects um, of mail art by Vigo and we found 61 more um, in uh, the archives. And uh, I'm so excited to kind of dive in and see uh, the diversity of our holdings on Vigo. Um, especially because I spent six months in his archive in La Plata on a Fulbright and then six months um, in, in uh, Bruschi's uh, studio in Recife. Um, but what I, what I do find so fascinating is that these objects are so difficult to classify. They contain visual poetry, they contain images, they contain slides, uh, hand-pulled prints, uh, multiples of stamps, um, uh, all of the, the artworks that I showed you earlier, those polished, beautiful artworks that I showed you earlier, magazines um, are, are in our collection and have really yet um, to be explored, even though we, we show them uh, quite often. So Vanessa, I have a question from the audience. Uh, do we know how Latin American postal carriers reacted to mail art? Did the artists ever report on this? Yes. Um, in fact, uh, in Argentina, just to give you one example, um, Vigo's work was often, or excuse me, the, the mail that Vigo received, the, art, the mail art that Vigo received, also often came opened. It was censored by the regime. So what, for example, something that would come from Japan would arrive uh, taped shut uh, with a fresh seal. Um, other things would be would have been removed that were referred to in letters inside would have been removed by the censors. Um, so censorship in Argentina and Brazil during this time um, of mail art even extended to mail art, even extended to this most innocuous um, form of communication, but one that of course was so subversive because it subverted the original uh, function of the of 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 the mail art system itself. So we have another question from Catherine McCallan. Uh, Vanessa, did mail art resonate with Leon Ferrari in Argentina in the 1960s and 70s with his works on paper that also sought to transform the function of the medium with subversive handwriting during oppressive government regimes? Yes, he did engage with mail art actually, um, especially because he moved to Brazil um, when, the, when the dictatorship uh, really became intolerable um, and he and his family were being, were being persecuted um, and he did indeed uh, create several pieces of mail art. He wasn't one of the major practitioners but he didn't indeed create mail art and I do think that's a very interesting and important connection this idea of handwriting to uh, single out um, in your question. Thank you for that question. So we have another question by Donald Kelly. Are there any popular or famous practitioners of mail art now? 
or is it a lost art? Did email kill male art? Oh my, I'm so glad you asked that because <laughs> I was ready for it. Let me see if I can get back to my slides here. Hold on just a moment. So um, what I did, um, in, I did a, I, I collaborated with Sergio Bessa um, of the Bronx Museum of Art um, on a, on a, uh, a show of Paula Bruschi's works um, that he curated at the Bronx Museum and I curated at the Phoenix Art Museum where I used to work. Um, and alongside this exhibition, I uh, had conversations with John Held Jr., who is, uh, really one of the most prolific writers on male art um, internationally. Um, and I asked him how uh, I could create a male art exhibition that was really an homage to Bruschi. Um, because the, the, the exhibition uh, that I did with Sergio Bessa for, uh, for Bruschi was called uh, Paula Bruschi, Art is Our Last Hope. Um, so what we ended up doing was sending out um, calls for entries like this, um, and the title was Focus Latin America, Art is Our Last Hope. So uh, curated by, as you see, Vanessa Davidson and John Hill Jr. We sent these out in Portuguese, Spanish, and English. We sent out 1,500 of them. Um, and in turn, we received 444 uh, artists responded to the call. So we, but, but many sent more than one artwork, so it was difficult to find space for them all. Uh, but what you're looking at here is a contemporary male art show that I organized in 2014, uh, 15, um, at the Phoenix Art Museum and also at Monarchy Gallery, which is a space um, in downtown Phoenix. Um, and what you're looking at are the very exceedingly diverse examples of how these contemporary male artists responded to that theme, Focus Latin America, Art is Our Last Hope. So we got not only uh, uh, works on paper and postcards and collages and photographs, but also, uh, as you see in this last slide, we got objects. People sent us boxes with objects inside, uh, which we exhibited. Um, and uh, from all over the world, um, from 35 countries, we received um, uh, submissions from these 444 male artists. And it was, in fact, uh, the first um, large scale exhibition of male art at a major US institution since the 1980s. So we were very happy um, to have had a hand in it um, and especially to have been able to share it with our community for so long because all of the works that we received uh, were so diverse and really invited close looking as you see here. So we have a follow up question from uh, uh, Rex Koons. Hi Rex, how are you? Uh, it's a follow-up question uh, about the, some of the examples that Vanessa show comes from Jacqueline Barnett's collection. And this is indeed um, a gift that Jacqueline gave to the plantain before she passed a couple of years ago. Uh, she was friends with many of these artists. Um, Ruski wrote to her very often and sent her mail art and photocopy art and all kinds of examples of his work. And uh, she collected it over the years. So before passing, she gave this extraordinary gift of conceptual art to, to the plant. And so that's why we have so many great examples from Ruski. That's a great question. Um. I think we can probably answer one more question. I did want to show you um, that one of the only requirements for staging a male art show um, and for getting artworks from artists for free, obviously, because they send them to you through the mail for a on a particular theme, is that you have to produce uh, a dress list of everyone who participated and share them with all the participants. So again, we circle back this idea of addresses as the Bibles of male artists. Um, addresses because uh, they were actively seeking new contacts, actively seeking like-minded individuals. And we should remember that in the 60s and 70s and 80s, Vigo, Bruschi, and Deutsch uh, used male art as a lifeline to the world beyond the margins. Uh, many artists in Latin America who developed male art had neither the resources nor, nor the means to travel, um, and therefore need, were desperate, voracious for that kind of interconnection. 
Um, so mail art had a very strong presence in Latin America, uh, one that I think is, should continue to be studied today uh, because we've only just scratched the surface. So we have a question. Was this art made with the idea of being collected? Has it been sold in auction? That is a question that I don't know the answer to yet, but I will find out and report back to you. Um, I've never seen any mail art at auction. I think that um, it would be a pity if it were included at auction because that would go contrary to the very essence of what mail art was supposed to be as an intercommunicational device um, subverting the postal service between uh, like-minded ind individuals in far-flung places. Um, but as far as I know, it has not been. But how about I'll report back next week? <laughs> Uh, Alison Brandes asks, um, uh, do you know of any communication this artist had with artists in the United States? I'm thinking of ASCO, the LA-based Chicano Collective, which primarily did performances, but also participated in male art circuits. So that's a very important connection. I'm so glad that that, that, that question was asked. Um, you know, I think that uh, we, we could consider uh, the, the connections that artists established um, from Latin America during this period went from LA to Hong Kong, from Amsterdam to um, to to Singapore, uh, from 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 France to, uh, to 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 Britain. They really had a large net, and those address those address lists were really what were crucial um, in helping artists. To connect with one another. So yes, the answer is yes. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap this up soon. Um, we're about out of time. I know everyone has dinner plans that they want to get along with, um, but I want to thank you so very much for accompanying us on this very, uh, very uh, uh, superficial dive into male art uh, because there's so much, so very much more to be explored. So thank you for joining us. Um, and Floor, did you have some comments about next week's uh, program? Sure. Uh, so, so thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and before you leave, we have several reminders. Our next curated conversation will be next Tuesday at uh, May 5th at 5 p.m. featuring the topic, the main event, Horses in Art, a curator Q&A. Uh, so to watch past curated conversation, take virtual tours and explore other museum from home content, go to blantonmuseum.org slash museum from home. If you wish to show your support, please consider contributing or becoming a member. You can become a member at blantonmuseum.org slash membership, and you can make donations at blantonmuseum.org slash support. Or if you like to subscribe to our email letter for info about upcoming programs and other news, sign up at blantonmuseum.org subscribe. And finally, if you have topics or you, that you would love to see us cover in future curated conversations, we're open to suggestions. So just drop us a line at media at blantonmuseum.org. Thanks again, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye.